Mike, your title is full of buzzwords, objects, interfaces, system, software, structure. What are we going to learn today, and what do these buzzwords mean? Well, there's three things I'd like to cover today. Um, the first is issues relating to objects in system software uh, as opposed to just in object-oriented programming languages. Uh, the second is the Object Management Group's uh, CORBA, Common Object Request Broker Architecture, uh, and how it attempts to solve some of these uh, problems in system software for objects. The third is how the CORBA architecture is used to allow object systems that already exist to be connected together. Now, I understand that in uh, object speak, there are a lot of buzzwords that are used uh, in, in, in fairly ambiguous ways. Um, I have some fairly specific meanings to these terms, and, uh, and I'd like to uh, describe them. To me, an object is a combination of computation and state uh, that, are, that are considered to be a unit. Uh, an object has its own integrity in that you can't just go in and manipulate part of it or, or associate the computation with some other state. Uh, the only way to manipulate an object is by uh, asking it, uh, by sending requests to it, uh, and, and letting it perform the actual operations. Um, Objects are self-describing, so when you walk up to an object, you can find out what it is. You don't necessarily have to know what an object is uh, ahead of time in order to use it. Um, an interface describes the shape of the object. Uh, it includes things like what the operations are, uh, how to go about making requests on the object. But what's important is that it doesn't include anything about the actual implementation of the object. It doesn't say anything about either the state or the computation. In a sense, the interface is the contracts between uh, the object and the clients of that object. Uh, and interfaces are also used to categorize objects. Uh, objects that share parts of their interfaces uh, are, are generally considered similar and interchangeable. Now, by system, I mean a broader context than you would normally have in a particular programming language. In a system, we're talking about a collection of components that have uh, uh, a number of properties. Uh, for example, they may be distributed. They may be physically in different places uh, and have to find some way to communicate together. Um, it, generally, a system is unbounded in the sense that dynamically, another part of the system can show up that you didn't know existed before. Um, in general, systems are uh, connected to uh, people that you don't necessarily trust. So uh, the various components have to be mutually suspicious. Uh, they have to check to see if the person who's making a request is, in fact, intended to be able to make a request. The various components in a system are autonomous. They start, stop, fail, recover independently as opposed to as a unit. And what is probably the most subtle property of systems, uh, but affects almost everything you do, is that they evolve. And there's no way to sort of, with one flip of the switch, change the way a system behaves. Uh, it's necessary to have simultaneously some older parts of the system and some newer parts of the system. Now, by software structure, I'm talking about how the software is organized at the macro level. I'm not as interested in this context in what happens inside a particular component, but I'm much more interested in the relationships between components um, and how those uh, components communicate with each other and what sort of mechanisms it takes to actually support uh, uh, components. Now, the object management group is a group of people from different companies that are all working on object systems. And uh, it turns out they're all working on different object systems uh, that are in some ways incompatible as people discover new things and new ideas in, in uh, uh, object-oriented programming. Um, what the group, the object management group, is trying to do is to figure out how to make those systems more compatible. And that happens in a couple of ways. One way is to figure out how to evolve them uh, so they are more similar. Uh, the other is to figure out how to make them so that even though they're different, they'll be able to play together. In some sense, it's interesting how the object management group works at two different levels. Uh, at the same time that they're working on the common concepts for the software to be able to have this uh, object system to be able to talk to this object system, they're also uh, evolving a set of terminology and, and way of describing things so that we can have this person who's working on objects be able to communicate adequately with this other person who's uh, working on objects. Now, the, the common object request broker architecture uh, is uh, their uh, basic object mechanism uh, 
Uh, and it has the philosophy, instead of the, the usual, well, my object system is better than your object system in, in, in these 12 ways, is, well, actually, your object system and my object system can uh, uh, play together. Um, so it turns out that partially by design and partially because of the problem it's trying to solve in plugging together uh, object systems, it, it turns out that CORBA contains a number of the solutions to the problem of system software and objects. Well, I do understand about object technology as used in programming languages like C++ and Smalltalk. But what's different about how are you going to use objects for system software? Some of the notions in object-oriented programming languages are of particular relevance to the system software environment. Uh, the, the combination of a computation unit and a, a, a piece of state uh, is something that happens in, in systems all the time, the, the notion of a process in a traditional operating system. The fact that there are well-defined interfaces, that you do information hiding, that uh, there can be multiple implementations of the uh, same service, uh, that you can do uh, extensions, that you can have relationships between different types of objects. These are all things that are extremely important in a system software environment, and they uh, are provided by uh, object-oriented technology in traditional programming language, traditional object-oriented programming languages. Um, on the other hand, there are some techniques that are used in a programming language context that really don't work very well in a system environment. For example, uh, implementation inheritance, the ability to reuse parts of other implementations, turns out not to be a good idea in the system software uh, environment because it creates a dependency between two different pieces of software that is not well defined, that is hard to evolve forward. So that's a, that's a concept that would not be appropriate in a system software environment that's OK in a programming language environment. It's also the case that types in object systems uh, generally need to be considered relative to who's telling you what the type is. If you trust the other component that you're interacting with, then you can trust the types that it provides you. But if that component might be a high school student breaking into your system, you can't exactly trust the fact when it says that this is uh, their driver's license and this is their uh, ID card. Uh, it might have been forged. Um, also, type checking in a system environment is done locally rather than globally. So the type checking is done within one program when it goes to interact with the system. Um, but it can't be done sort of from one program to another program. The, the system can't provide all of those guarantees because one program could be working in one language with one type system. The other program could be working in another language in another type system. There really isn't a way to, to uh, make all of that be consistent. Um, now, if we look at how system software has evolved, uh, we can see that there are some changes in structure uh, that lead us towards object-oriented uh, uh, solutions to system software problems. In the early mainframe computers, the system itself has lots of functionality, but it tends to be fixed uh, and not easy to extend, and programs generally go to the system uh, to get uh, their work done. Well, when PCs came along, it turned out that the system had very little functionality in it. When people wanted to do particular things, they would go out and they would buy an application. And the application would have almost all of the functionality that the user wanted in it. And it was really a classic example of you get what you pay for. If you bought this application, you'd have that functionality. If you didn't, you wouldn't. In a modern distributed system, uh, there's an, more of an open-ended set of functions that are available because you're connected to a network of machines that can be potentially unbounded, and you could access a service somewhere out there in the network. Um, in general, there's little distinction in this environment between what's in the system and what's an extension or what a particular user adds. Uh, and uh, access to the services is sort of independent of where it is. The environment is used as, as a whole. So in this environment, it's sort of natural to focus on software organized as a set of components uh, that we want to be able to extend and replace these components, that we want to be able to wander around the network, discover components, and be able to use them. And when I look at all these things, it sounds like objects to me. Well, I can see that uh, objects would be good for system software, but what would you really want to use them for? Well, in a word, everything. Uh, if I had to use two words, I'd probably say almost everything. Um, one of the things that objects allow us to do is to unify things, both uh, uh, across different functionalities and uh, across different levels uh, and, and different granularities in the software environment. Um, so uh, in a 
in a system context, being able to unify things across different functionalities is extremely important. You know, a system environment is like a service industry. Uh, its main purpose in life is to provide access to things. And it's really much more convenient if I can use the same mechanism to get access to a wide variety of services. I don't want to have to use the telephone to get to some things and, a, and the mail to get to other things. I'd like to be able to get to all of the services that I want uh, in, in the same way. So, Objects are general enough to be able to do this. Uh, for example, we can use objects for OS concepts, operating system concepts like files, users, mailboxes. We can use them for application concepts like paragraphs, cells, and bitmaps. We can use them for communication pipes and sockets and, and hot links that will give me updated views of data. Uh, various services like printing or, or network mail or naming. Uh, and all of these things can be done as objects, and uh, it gives us a uniform way of describing these services uh, because of the fact that we've unified them in this, in this way. Now, objects are also flexible enough to cover different levels of services. For example, from things as lightweight as toolkits, uh, a button object in a Windows system where a synchronization variable can be an object, uh, things you would normally think of you'd do a system call for, like a page or, or an access write. Um, being able to do things, uh, access services that you would traditionally do by way of an IPC or an RPC, an authentication service, or, or a database server. Uh, and in fact, even things as large as whole programs or multiple programs, uh, a multimedia document that might consist of uh, a number of different uh, parts, uh, could all be uh, viewed uh, as objects. By, by being able to span these multiple levels, we provide the same mechanism that we can use, uh, uh, the same way to access things, independent of whether it's a small thing or, or a large thing. Well, you've probably heard the old saying that to a person who has only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and in a certain sense, objects can make this possible. And, and applying object technology to the system environment is, in some sense, trying to make everything look like a nail and then make sure that everybody gets a hammer. Um, however, one of the things that it's, we must be careful about is uh, trying to use a single solution to solve uh, too wide a range of a problem. Um, uh, you, you may notice that I have large hands, and uh, one of the problems that I have is one size fits all gloves because they basically just don't fit. Uh, the CORB architecture has a variety of places where different choices can be made, different implementation techniques can be used uh, according to the granularity, frequency access, and other properties of the objects. So we get to be able to use the same framework, the same architecture, the same uh, mode of description for objects, but we have different abilities to implement them uh, so that we can actually uh, take advantage of the things that we know about different kinds of objects. Okay, so you've told me that everything in a system can consider to be an object, and now you're talking about the CORBA. Just what is the CORBA? Well, uh, uh, I should take a minute and first uh, tell you the question that CORBA was designed to answer because OMG uh, did a request for technology for a thing that they called the ORB, the Object Request Broker, uh, which is the basic mechanism uh, to uh, allow communication between objects. Um, and the uh, process that, that we went through to submit CORBA and, and to get a number of companies to work together in defining CORBA uh, as the answer to that uh, uh, question caused us to pull together a lot of different ideas uh, in this common solution. And it really helped make it so that uh, CORBA spans a wider range of solutions uh, than it might have if we'd just taken any individual object system and called that the object request broker. Um, so the approach was to uh, define whatever things we could that were in common across the various object systems that, that we knew about uh, or that we were working with um, so that we could envision portable applications that could work the same in these different environments by relying on these common things and also so that we could have the basis for communication between the different object systems. Uh, we also then tried to define an architecture that could embrace multiple systems, uh, either by having them adapt uh, and, and, and support the core of the architecture without having to uh, rewrite them from scratch, um, and also to allow future evolution, optimization, and extension of systems as we learned more about them. Uh, 
Um, so uh, CORBA is essentially an architecture designed to unify uh, multiple orbs. It's not just a single uh, or implementation of an object request broker. And, and it's designed to allow uh, a portability of applications across these different object systems and interoperability between them. OK, so I understand that CORBA is the architecture for the orbs, and the orbs are what allow us to have objects. So let's be more specific about what an object is. Can you tell me, in concrete terms, just what is an object? Well, y yes and no. Uh, in uh, CORBA, the concrete definition of an object is that it's an abstraction. Uh, un uh, fortunately, <laughs> it, fortunately, it turns out that there is a concrete thing that you can put your finger on, or your program can put its finger on, uh, and that's what we call an object reference. Uh, the client of an object uh, accesses it by using an object reference, and that is something that you can uh, uh, have uh, uh, and, and, and pass around and use to refer to the objects. Um, uh, it, the only way to experience the real object, however, is to do operations using the object reference. It's sort of like the philosophical question about the tree in the north woods, and if it falls, does it make a sound? And uh, in the CORBA uh, environment, it only makes a sound if you have an object reference to it and you call the listen operation uh, uh, to, to determine that it's uh, uh, actually made a sound. Uh, otherwise, you can't tell what's actually there. Um, now, as I mentioned, you can store, pass around uh, object references, and the, the, the world is sort of connected together by uh, these object references. Uh, many clients can have the equivalent uh, a reference to a particular object, and there can actually be multiple references uh, to the same object. For example, if the object is a file, some object references might support the right operation. Other, operation, uh, other object references would not support uh, the right operation. So you can actually have uh, uh, multiple object references for the same uh, object. In general, you don't know anything about how the object is actually uh, implemented or where it is. You have the object reference, you do an operation on it, uh, you get the answer back. That's, that's the extent that you can know uh, about the object itself. Um, now, the operation is a transfer of control and data. So a client initiates the call. Uh, the object reference determines exactly where the call is going to go. Uh, the operation that, that is specified determines what code is actually going to be executed. The parameters get transmitted to uh, the destination where the uh, object is actually implemented. Control is transferred there. Uh, the implementation then runs, does whatever uh, the, the operation requested, uh, produces some results, and then those results are transmitted back to the client, uh, control transfers back to the client, and then the client uh, continues. So the client effectively sees this uh, a, as a procedure call uh, that it makes, and the implementation sees it as a procedure call that seems to come uh, out of nowhere into the implementation. Um, so from now on, when I say object, what I really mean is the abstract entity that's specified uh, by an object reference, because that's, the, the, in practice, what it means in, in the CORBA context. OK, so I understand I don't have an object. I have an object reference. So I have this object reference, and now I want to perform some operation. How do I do that, and what does the orb do for me? Well, the, the orb does a number of things to make it easy and convenient uh, for you to uh, do operations on, on objects. And, and I'll, I'll mention some of them in a little bit. Um, basically, the assumption is that you're writing a program in your favorite programming language. And for the sake of discussion, let's assume that's C++. Um, you have some representation in your programming language of the uh, object reference. And let's suppose that that's a, a surrogate object that you might have uh, uh, in C++ that, that looks like a normal C++ object. Um, you then want to be able to call some code that, that will do this work for you, because for, for your purposes, you'd like it to look like a procedure call. And in the C++ context, that's liable to be a method on this surrogate object. Now, that method we call a stub. And it's going to do the work of figuring out what other stuff it needs to do to actually cause the operation to be transmitted to uh, the implementation. So the stub and the orb uh, cooperate to uh, actually cause the parameters to be transmitted and the uh, implementation to be located. On the implementation side, there's a thing called a skeleton, which is analogous to the stub, um, which tries to then call an appropriate method um, uh, that's the implementation of that particular operation. Um, when that method returns, the skeleton then takes the return values, passes them back using the orb, um, and then the stub on the client side returns, passing those things back to the programming language environment that, that the caller had, presumably in a way uh, that, that's convenient for that programmer. So, so the goal is for the client to think that it's simply calling a local re 
routine and the implementation to appear to be called locally. And the orbs, the, plus, the orb plus the stubs plus the skeleton sort of cooperate to provide the glue to make these two pieces fit together. Um, note that the interfaces to the stubs and the skeletons are in fact language specific. We call this a language mapping. Uh, and it can be customized for a particular programming language. So if your programming language has objects, you're liable to have a binding, uh, a language mapping that makes it look more like objects. If you're programming in Fortran or something like that, well, you, you'll have to use your imagination to see where the objects are in, in this program. Uh, CORBA currently defines a standard mapping for C, uh, and they're currently working on C++ and some other mappings. Um, now, note that the client and the implementation mapping can be completely different, and the ORB has to solve the problem of having a COBOL program call uh, an implementation that's written in Smalltalk, and, and it does solve that problem. An important feature of the stubs is that while uh, the interface to the client and to the implementation is the same, uh, the interface between the stub or the skeleton and the ORB uh, is specific to the ORB implementation. This is really important because the ORBs may be implemented quite differently, and the right thing to do to map a, uh, a particular programming language into a particular ORB may be different in different cases. Um, so the stubs and the skeletons uh, take care of this problem of mapping uh, the uh, language environment into the particular ORB. Uh, the, neither the clients nor the implementation have to be concerned with generating the stubs uh, or the skeletons, however. So that sounds pretty easy. All I do have to do to do an operation on an object reference is make a function call. Is that really all there is to it? Well, for the uh, users, uh, that's pretty close. Unfortunately, for ORB implementers, there's more to it. Um, uh, note that I didn't say anything about uh, where the client and where the implementation are. The ORB has to keep track of this. Uh, as the object reference gets passed around, it's got to be able to get back to wherever the implementation happens to be, whether you're crossing machine boundaries. Uh, if you're going onto a machine with a different architecture, it's going to have to figure out how to translate the parameters into the data formats that are appropriate for that architecture. Uh, there may be differences in operating systems, et cetera, that have to be uh, overcome. Um, in fact, the ORB manages the object references persistently. So uh, you could have an object reference, uh, save it, come back tomorrow, that object reference is still supposed to work uh, unless that object has been destroyed. Uh, so you can store object references in the middle of files and documents or whatever. The ORB also keeps track of the type of object references because you want to know what kind of an object uh, this object reference refers to. Uh, besides invocation, the ORB also provides functions like creation and deletion of objects. Um, and when you do uh, an operation, if the implementation, because you got bored and, and didn't use the object for uh, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, isn't active at the moment, uh, the ORB will actually start up the implementation uh, in, in order to get it running uh, before it delivers the request. Uh, there's also an interface definition language for specifying the interfaces, uh, defining what the operations are. Uh, that interface definition language is used to produce the stubs and the skeletons. Um, and that information is also stored in an interface repository, so we can find out what interfaces uh, are supported by a particular object at runtime. The ORB supports the notion of uh, object adapters, so there can be different styles of implementations as well. Um, so the ORB provides a number of functions that make it easy for uh, the, the client and the implementation, but this means that the ORB is responsible uh, with the stubs and the skeleton and the interface repository for keeping track of this information uh, for the convenience of the clients and the implementations. So you mentioned interface definition language. Does this mean that I have to learn another new programming language to use this system? Well, uh, it, it is necessary to learn another language, uh, but you actually don't program in it. Uh, the interface definition language, or IDL, some people say ITL, uh, is used for defining the operations on objects. Um, I'm actually fond of the name we used for the research prototype of this language, which was contract, because uh, the interface definition language is trying to express the uh, agreements between the clients and the implementations of the objects. Um, it defines the things that most object systems have, like operations, what, what they do, uh, signatures, how you actually request them, uh, exceptions, what might go wrong when you try to do a particular operation. Uh, it groups operations together uh, in interfaces and allows there to be uh, relationships between interfaces. Uh, there's interface inheritance, which expresses sort of what operations are in common between uh, uh, two different interfaces. 
Uh, on the other hand, there are some important things that the interface definition language doesn't say. Uh, for example, it doesn't name any instances uh, of objects. You have to get those yourself. Um, it doesn't say anything about how the object is implemented, uh, where it is. Um, and uh, also, it's important to note that there's no correspondence between an interface and any particular implementation. Uh, there can be uh, a large number of different, completely unrelated implementations of the same interface. And there may be some interfaces for which there are no uh, actual implementations. So whether your implementation uh, of, of an object is written in C and it's inside your program, or whether it's written in Fortran and it's on Mars, uh, it could be the same interface. And, and, and you wouldn't notice any difference. Um, now, as far as programming, uh, there are no executable statements in IDL. So uh, in that sense, it's not a new programming language. You write programs in your own language. Uh, and what you have to understand is the mapping that IDL has uh, to the language that, that you want to program in. Uh, now, uh, uh, IDL has uh, C or C++ style syntax, for, for which we sort of apologize. Uh, it at least has a syntax that's familiar uh, and data types that are familiar uh, it continues to have all the same problems that C and C++ do in that space, but uh, we decided we'd rather not make new mistakes in, in, in that area. Now, it turns out that inheritance is crucial uh, for systems, and so I want to say a little bit about that uh, and, and how inheritance is used in, in IDL. Um, it's often the case in systems where you, you want to deal with objects without knowing their exact type. Uh, for example, if you have something that's a document, then a spreadsheet is a kind of document, and a printer can print a document, then that means a printer can print a spreadsheet. Uh, with IDL, we're able to express those relationships uh, uh, precisely. Um, when you use interface inheritance, you're asserting that uh, the, the spreadsheet object, in fact, can be used and supports all the operations that a document has. Um, since any, all that anybody can know about a, an object is what's expressed in the interface, uh, if they see an object that has a document interface and that's what they use, they don't care what else might be uh, true about that particular kind of document. Well, I understand about interfaces. Uh, I write C++ class definitions and put them in header files. Why are you putting so much emphasis on interface in this system? Well, in, in system software, we use these interface techniques over and over again. There's uh, generic services, as I mentioned, like printer. Uh, if you look at a system today like Unix, the only way you can really tell that a file and a pipe and a socket are really uh, something in common. Well, you can look at the code, um, or you can read the man pages and say, boy, these seem to say a lot of the same things about these different uh, uh, concepts. Um, this happens all the time in systems that we build different implementations of, of the same kinds of things. We want to have them related together. And the, the interface uh, scheme allows us to express that directly. Uh, it's also the case that we want to allow alternate implementations of the same interfaces. So if, for example, there's a mousetrap interface, uh, you can look at that interface and say, hey, I, I can build a better mousetrap. Uh, you can do that. And when you pro provide that service, when you provide that mousetrap, what you know is that all of the other parts of the system that expect to use mousetraps will work with your mousetrap. Because the only thing they could possibly know is the interface. And if you've successfully implemented that interface, those parts of the system uh, uh, more or less have to work with, with your flavor of mousetrap. It's also the case that systems evolve. Um, and we often will be in a situation where we want uh, uh, either newer versions of the same interface or uh, extended interfaces. We want to make it so that uh, clients of the old interface uh, can use the new objects and, uh, without worrying about the extensions. Uh, at the same time, we want to make it so that clients of the newer interfaces uh, can, in fact, use the new features. Um, extensions are another thing that are common in systems. These are things where you want to add uh, uh, value-added versions of, of existing facilities. For example, if you wanted to have uh, a compressed version of files so that they would take uh, less space on the disk. Um, so new objects that are uh, this, this new extended service will work with other uh, services because they're still files. Uh, but you may decide, well, geez, I don't want to spend all my time uh, 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 compressing and uncompressing this file. So I want to do an operation on this compressed file uh, that says, well, don't compress it uh, because I want it to run faster uh, or, or whatever. So you want to access uh, the extended functionality and be able to have additional control uh, uh, on that service. And the important thing is that all of these things end up being first class because they're all described in the same way, because they're all accessed the same way, whether it's a, a uh, built-in system function, whether it's an installation-specific uh, 
uh, a function, whether it's something that an individual user has, whether it's permanent or temporary or, or conditional used in certain circumstances, they're all done the same way. Another key aspect about how IDL does inheritance is that it uses multiple inheritance. And in fact, we encourage the use of multiple inheritance uh, for interfaces. With single inheritance, you have to decide where to put the various interfaces in the interface tree. Uh, if you put things too close to the root, you end up having things that are not necessarily making sense for all of the objects that are below them in the uh, uh, type tree. On the other hand, if you spread these interfaces out at multiple places in the type tree, uh, you no longer have the type relationship between those two different uh, uh, subtrees. Uh, for example, if you consider the traditional sort of IO stream and file kind of relationship, where would you add replication to this picture? Uh, should you uh, add it below IO stream? Should you add it above IO stream so that file can inherit it also? Uh, do you add it uh, below IO stream and below file, in which case a replicated IO stream uh, isn't the same, uh, is, isn't a, uh, uh, the same type as a uh, replicated uh, file? Um, uh, I actually have a sort of a hobby of, of class hierarchy archaeology. It's sort of like hierarchyology. I don't know what, if, if that's a new word. Um, Basically, when people are defining single inheritance hierarchies, there's some point in time after which it's difficult to change the hierarchy. And that's because, well, you've shipped some products. There are a lot of people that are depending upon it. Um, and so you can't add new things to the base classes. And it's always interesting to look and see what things got into the base classes because it was easy to do, uh, and, and what things didn't get in later when it was uh, too hard to do. With multiple inheritance, a new interface becomes a new root node in the interface graph. And it can be inherited wherever it's appropriate. Uh, so you can use objects that support the new interface independent of what other interfaces they might uh, have or where they are in the uh, early, uh, previous parts of the type graph. Uh, in the example of, of replicated file, uh, a replicated file can be a replicated IO stream. Uh, and you can use replicated things independent of um, uh, what other things they, they might happen to be. Now, although these sort of type and interface and inheritance issues are important for programming languages, uh, they are really paramount in uh, software systems because although it may be possible to recompile a whole program, uh, it's not really practical to ever recompile a, a whole system and all of the software that will depend upon the system class hierarchy. So uh, there are so many different suppliers of software. Uh, you have to be able to use software without knowing uh, more than is necessary. You have to allow other people uh, to have a stable base to uh, depend upon. And uh, that means that you have to spend a lot more time making sure you get the interfaces right. But uh as you pointed out earlier, a uh, distributed system is very dynamic and would seem to require a dynamically typed object system. But what you're describing seems to be statically typed. Isn't that a problem? Well, uh, the system is definitely st statically typed. And, and there are sort of two reasons for that. Um, the second is that, in fact, we managed to get a fair amount of dynamic behavior in spite of the fact that our types are static. Uh, but the first reason that I want to say is that the static is actually better for our problems. Um, we want to have type systems that actually document and guarantee the, the contract analogy what the objects are going to be able to do. And, and so we don't want to have the, the opportunity for someone to change things without having that reflected somehow uh, in, in the type system. Um, a lot of times, software components are going to uh, first be introduced to each other at the customer's site. And uh, the customer is going to want to know who to blame if these two things don't work together. And the type system is a way that says, well, look, here's how it's supposed to work. Uh, so you know that guy's misbehaving or this guy's misbehaving, so you know which uh, customer service number to call. Um, we can still have a lot of generality with inherited interfaces, because there can be lots of differences among uh, uh, implementations. Uh, and of course, we do have the opportunity to do checking in uh, uh, compiled languages by having static types. So before you ship your product, you can know that it's going to do the right things relative to uh, the system-defined interfaces. Uh, and, and if there are bugs to be found, they're probably going to be in someone else's software. But, but it turns out that uh, we also provide, with IDL and in the ORB, uh, a number of features that are normally associated with dynamic type systems. Uh, for example, uh, new interfaces uh, and implementations can be added without disrupting the type system, as I mentioned, with uh, multiple inheritance. Uh, it's possible to discover at runtime uh, an object and find out what its type is, uh, and then uh, figure out how to uh, actually use it uh, using the uh, interface repository. Uh, and you can delay the determination of the exact type 
uh, of an object for a long period of time. So you can use objects without actually caring uh, what their exact type is. There's two ways of uh, dealing with types dynamically. Uh, the first is to use the get interface operation to get the information the interface repository information. Um, that's not always what you want because it's going to give you uh, a very specific answer to the question of what type are you. Uh, if what you need uh, is a file and what you get from the interface repository is something that says that it's a vacuum cleaner, uh, you may have to run around in the type hierarchy to figure out, okay, where in vacuum cleaner do I find uh, uh, the file interface? Um, uh, but it does have all the information that you need, so if you stumble across this new object and you say, oh, it's a vacuum cleaner, you can go and find out what sorts of things, uh, what sorts of operations that object might actually support. A more common way to deal with types dynamically is an operation that we call narrow, um, which is a variation on the normal programming language narrow uh, because of the fact that you can do it across multiple uh, parts of the tree with, with multiple inheritance. And that is that you ask if the object has a particular interface, and then it gives you that particular interface view. So if you have this thing, and it turns out to be a vacuum cleaner, and you're asking if it's a file, uh, I can point you to the part of it that looks like a file and, and not have to bother you with the fact that it really is a vacuum cleaner. If you were interested in using file operations, you're then able to use them, uh, ignoring the rest of the details of what the object is. Okay, well, we've talked about how I can use an object that's out there in the system. But now it comes to the point where I want to start defining my own objects. How do I go about implementing an object? Well, an implementation is uh, pretty much guaranteed to be more complicated than uh, a client. We spend a lot of time trying to make uh, it easy for the customers in some sense of objects. Uh, but the implementation, of course, has to do the real work. Uh, it has to deal with creating and deleting and preserving the state and, and, and all those sorts of things. But the core of an implementation of objects is very similar to what an implementation of objects would be in a typical object-oriented programming language. Um, basically, the orb and the skeleton are set up uh, to make it so that uh, you simply plug in the methods that do the operations uh, in, in, into the orb. However, because we're dealing with a system, there are two extra concerns. Uh, the first is security. This is this uh, uh, high school student out there that's trying to break into your system. Uh, and you've got to decide who's allowed to do which operations. Um, and there's also uh, the issue of asynchrony, uh, because you can have several requests uh, made at the same time. Uh, both of these issues can be dealt with in either a simple or a complex way, uh, depending upon the object. For example, if it's a really simple object, I can just acquire a lock and then release it uh, at, at the beginning and end of each method, uh, and, and that will pretty much solve the problem. Uh, for more interesting objects, I may in fact want to release the uh, locks partway through an operation to allow other operations to start or, or uh, make progress. Similarly, with the uh, uh, security issue, uh, I could simply delegate it to an authentication service and say, protect me, or I may uh, choose to have more fine gearing control and I'm going to look at your ID and say, well, well, this is a good thing for you to be able to do, and then I'm going to go look in my database and, and, and make my own decisions. Um, so you have a range of, of, of possibilities, and there's a good opportunity for uh, using some standard system facilities to make life easier. Probably the major difference between a programming language uh, object implementation and a CORBA object implementation, however, is activation. Uh, because objects are persistent, they can last a long time, uh, you as an implementation may get bored or tired or your system may crash, uh, and then sometime later a request comes in. Well, the ORB provides the means for uh, you to get started, uh, get your state set up again uh, before it actually delivers that request to you. Uh, this involves a number of up calls from the orb and some down calls back to the orb to register uh, your implementation and say uh, that, 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 you're, that you're ready to go. Um, this is another place where the architecture provides a number of hooks so that you can do it in some very general uh, and, and complicated ways if you need to. Uh, but it's also a place where if you're using standard storage facilities or uh, if you're doing something pretty traditional, you can probably find uh, the right routine to just plug into your implementation uh, and, and uh, uh, let somebody else do the actual work. Well, you've described a wide range of uh, choices I could make when I do an object implementation, but what, what do I have available to me to make those choices? What kind of choices do I have? Different object implementations can be quite different and have some real differences in what they expect from uh, the orb. And to avoid having to have one size fits all uh, object implementations, um, we've invented a concept uh, that we call the object adapter. And 
Uh, this really is an important architectural feature of, of the CORBA uh, system because it's the thing that allows us to have sort of multiple sizes of interfaces to uh, the orb. So an object adapter defines the interface to the orb, uh, including operations for creating and deleting and moving objects. And it also pins down the exact structure of the skeletons. All the skeletons for all the object adapters are probably going to be pretty similar. But there may be some important differences in exactly how the request is delivered. The basic object adapter uh, is the only one that the object management group has yet approved, uh, but we're investigating a couple of others uh, already. Um, we probably don't want a large number of object adapters because in order to make portable object implementations, uh, all of the orbs have to support all of the possible uh, object adapters. Um, so in general, you only want to have an object adapter uh, if there's really a radically different uh, set of requirements from uh, the orb for a particular object implementation. Okay, so you've mentioned the, the one object adapter, the basic object adapter. What kind of object implementations would I use that object adapter for? Well, the basic object adapter is aimed at what I might call server-style implementations. It's sort of in the middle of the range of, of granularity. We're not talking about nuclear aircraft carriers as objects, but we're also not talking about subatomic particles as objects. It's things like documents or spreadsheet cells or users or, or system concepts like that. The assumption is that the implementation of the object can be protected from the client, uh, that it can have this general activation mechanism of being started up uh, independent of other objects. The orb actually will remember about 1k bytes of, of state for uh, each object if you want. Uh, and it assumes that there is external visibility uh, of those objects, that they are going to be passed around. Um, and so it also has a security model uh, that, that assumes uh, access control lists. Um, the performance expectations for this kind of object is probably on the order of a few dozen invocations per second. You probably aren't going to get up to a million, but you can probably uh, do something in that range. It shouldn't take uh, an hour and a half to do an invocation. Um, it has actually a rich set of activation uh, mechanisms because there will be different kinds of implementations for objects. Um, uh, a typical one is that a server might have many objects implemented in it. So when you start it up for the first object that you use, uh, it says, oh, by the way, I implement all these other ones so you don't have to uh, do the extra work of activating those uh, objects separately. Um, on the other uh, extreme is uh, an object where each operation will start up a different program. This would tend to be for a larger uh, size object where you would have a, a program to print or, or edit the object. Um, we expect the basic object adapter to be able to be used for most common application uh, in, in, in system objects, and, and that's why it was the first one that we designed. Well, in fact, it seems to cover a very wide range of objects. Uh, can you give me an example of another kind of object adapter that would be quite different? Well, the, 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 the next one that we're likely to uh, try to standardize is the one that we call the library object adapter. And this is for objects that I, I might call toolkit style implementations, uh, things that you would normally expect to be in, in an object library. Um, the objects are fine grain and very lightweight, things like buttons in a window system toolkit or, or simple data structures. Um, the difference in these objects is that they're expected to co-reside with the client, which means that you have to be very careful writing the environmental impact statement of the object uh, because it could have impact on uh, the, the, the client that's trying to use it. Um, but it also has a simpler notion of activation because it's assumed to be activated with the client, so you don't have to do a lot of uh, uh, separate work. There's no orb state. We're trying to keep these things lightweight. Uh, and the assumption is that these aren't going to be externally visible, although there are ways to make them visible if you pass them out. Uh, there's no security. If you're going to live with the, uh, the client, it presumably can do to you whatever it wants. Um, and the, the main reason for supporting this different style of object is that we expect to have uh, much stronger performance requirements to be able to do thousands of invocations uh, per second. Uh, and we can probably do this because there isn't security, there isn't the extra state, and they, they have limited visibility. Well, these do sound quite different. Won't that mean that when I use a BOA object or a LOA object, I'll have to do different things to, to use those different objects? Well, no. The, the whole goal here is to make it so that clients use the objects the same way and aren't aware of the choice of object adapter. Um, this is why we want to make it so that if a client has uh, an object that happens to be implemented by the library object adapter and it passes it, uh, say, on a call using an object that's implemented by the basic object adapter that's going out to Mars, uh, that we will do the right thing, we'll make that library uh, uh, adapter object be available through a basic object adapter uh, so that it can be accessed externally. 
Um, on the other hand, we do win because for objects that tend to be local and tend to be accessed locally, uh, we get the performance, performance advantage, and uh, don't, uh, although we do have to worry a little bit more about the environmental impact statement, um, but we still do have the generality, so if it's an occasional thing that we pass one of these objects to Mars, uh, we, we figure out how to uh, make that work. Um, but you can see from these two examples how important it is uh, to have an object adapter. These are quite different uh, 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 sets of requirements. Unfortunately, if we would have burdened all objects with having uh, security, for example, that would make the uh, uh, fine grain objects much more heavyweight. Uh, on the other hand, if we constrained all objects to not have any state and, and to not do uh, uh, activation, uh, that would make it hard to construct the range of uh, uh, server style objects that we'd like to be able to do. Okay, so I'm, I'm implementing an object and you've told me about interface inheritance, but you still haven't told me how I might use implementation inheritance. Well, that's that's because I don't want to use implementation inheritance. Uh, basically, uh, I, I'm sort of opposed to implementation inheritance, although uh, there's probably some uh, amendment to the Constitution that says I have to let you do it. Um, the problem is that when I do implementation inheritance, I create dependencies between the, the part that I inherit and the new part that I write that is not written down anywhere. The guy who wrote the original implementation doesn't know what parts I depend on and what parts are safe for uh, a change. And, uh, I'm not sure what parts uh, might be changed tomorrow. Um, uh, but it turns out that the CORBA doesn't say much about uh, implementation inheritance either way. Um, the requirement is that when you register an implementation for an object, you have to provide an implementation for all of the operations. Where those methods come from and whether those methods are shared with other uh, object implementations, we don't know, and, and, and in some sense, we don't care. Uh, if you have uh, a programming language that supports uh, implementation inheritance, and you want to build a collection of implementations that reuse parts of, uh, of the code, uh, that's okay as far as Corbett is concerned. But it's important not to assume that because you used implementation inheritance in your implementation that that's going to have any effect on other implementations because there's no way to force other implementations to reuse any parts of your code. Uh, it, it's always possible for them to write it all from scratch. Um, but what I might suggest as an alternative to implementation inheritance is what is usually called delegation, uh, and it's effectively using another object uh, for some of the methods, performing operations on that other object to get those uh, methods. Uh, it's safe because you're using that other object abstractly. You're just invoking operations the same way anybody else might be able to, and the fact that you're doing your operations by invoking uh, its operations, that's, that's fine. Um, so my, my standard phrase in this uh, uh, area is that I want objects to use, uh, not to be reused. Um, reuse implies that I'm going to do something partial with the implementation. It requires me to understand something about the implementation, and it adds this dependence. Use implies that I'm going to have a coherent abstraction. I'm just going to use the interface, and, and I get the clean separation that I want. Well, we've, we've talked about how I could use the objects out there in the world, and you've told me how I can implement some of those objects out there. But uh, what about this orb that makes all this happen? Can you tell me about what's going on inside the orb? Well, sure. Um, remember, Corbett was designed to allow the integration of uh, different systems, so it's hard for me to tell you what any one of them will do. Uh, but we do have some uh, experience with this style of system, and we do the do know that there is sort of a range of, uh, of possibilities. Um, remember, we want to be able to adapt some existing systems, but we probably will build some from scratch, and it might be interesting to think about what some of those ones that would be built from scratch might look like. Uh, currently, most uh, orbs are designed to be systems that are approximately RPC style. Uh, the uh, object reference is used to locate the server. You use the RPC mechanism to actually pass the request. Um, it has the advantage that RPC systems already exist. You have the advantage of building on widespread uh, technology that works in a distributed environment. And it's good to have that to fall back on. Uh, if you build a, an orb that is uh, better in some way but more limited, uh, that's, that's going to make it hard for you to get access to all the things out there. And having another orb that you can fall back on to uh, get access to that wider set of services uh, is always a good idea. Uh, 
Um, the ideal orb uh, is, is probably something like an object microkernel. Uh, you can make it be efficient. You can make it be secure. Um, you can forward a request up to networking software when you have to cross machine boundaries. Uh, and uh, um, uh, here at, at Sun Labs, uh, we have a research prototype on Spark uh, that can do a cross address space call in about 100 cycles. So we can see that we can get fairly reasonable performance uh, if we design the microkernel uh, to be object-oriented from the start. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other optimizations that are possible. Uh, for example, being able to pass uh, parameters in shared memory and, and, and having memory shared between uh, the client and the implementation. Uh, it, object systems have sort of gotten a bad rap for uh, being slow, and we've spent a lot of time in uh, uh, our, our research and also in doing uh, the Corva architecture. Uh, to make sure that there's room there for optimizations, that we can get uh, uh, the performance that we need to make these things be used uh, all the time, every day. Um, and uh, it's important to understand that as we do these kinds of optimizations, as we change from RPC to microkernel to shared memory, uh, uh, org implementation, the client and the implementation stay the same. So uh, what the client sees, what the implementation sees, uh, uh, it, it, what the code they write is, uh, is the same. And, and we're replacing the ORB and the uh, communication mechanisms uh, uh, between uh, uh, in a transparent way. Uh, now it turns out that clients can use different ORBs uh, simultaneously. Uh, uh, and, and this is basically an application of object-oriented design to uh, the way you access the stubs. And by making the particular stubs be associated with the particular piece of data that's the object reference, uh, we can uh, make it so that you can get to the right stub for that object reference uh, uh, right away and then be doing code that is appropriate for that particular implementation. Um, so you can see that we've provided a number of places in the architecture uh, where uh, we can get leverage on performance. In the orb itself, by using stubs and skeletons to allow us to have uh, the orb implemented uh, as efficiently as possible and bring that right up to the programming language level. Uh, in the structure of the implementations uh, and, and the uh, interfaces provided by the object adapter to make them uh, allow us to have the best possible implementations, uh, and in the support for multiple orbs uh, so that you could have orbs that are optimized for different situations and could have different characteristics. Well, you talked about all these different orbs. It would seem important that these orbs talk to each other. So what does OMG and the CORBA say about interoperability? Well, the first thing to understand is that uh, useful interoperability has to be brought up to the application level. What really matters is, can my word processor use your spreadsheet? Uh, and there's a lot of agreements that have to happen there, data formats, protocols, how we rendezvous, update policies, and stuff like that. Um, CORBA addresses it at the lowest level to get us going. And in some sense, it's like the telegraph. We've agreed on Morse code. Um, so we have the basic communication mechanism that we can uh, use, and everybody knows how to transmit Morse code back and forth, whether they're doing it over radio waves or over wires. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't yet agreed, to, are we speaking French or are we speaking English? And uh, OMG is working on some of these higher level agreements that are going to make uh, interoperability uh, up to the application level actually be possible. However, we have focused on making it possible for orbs to connect together because we agree that the things being communicated are object invocations and objects and uh, uh, parameters that are defined in the interface definition language. Uh, we can plug them together uh, using something uh, very analogous to a telegraph repeater, which has sort of a clicker connected to another key that allows you to transmit from one uh, uh, medium to another. We can have the same concept in orbs, which we call uh, a gateway. A gateway knows how to understand requests from the two orbs that it's connecting together and translates the data formats and, and passes the information, takes a request from one side and turns it into a request on the other side. Um, one of the subtle parts about this is that when I pass an object reference from one orb to another, what I want to do is replace it with an object reference that points back to the gateway so that when I'm over in this ob uh, orb and I make a request, I get back to the gateway and then it knows how to pass that request uh, uh, on to the other uh, uh, to, to the object in the other orb. Um, so with CORBA, uh, a program can use objects that are implemented in different orbs, either because the, program, the, the environment that that program is running in has access to multiple orbs, uh, or because uh, it's accessing objects that have been passed to it from another orb uh, through a gateway. Um, and 
as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the CORBA is trying to integrate different object systems. Uh, there, it turns out now we can look back and see that there's actually three different ways that I could take an existing object system and figure out how to get it connect into uh, the CORBA architecture. One is I can make the object system appear as a normal object implementation and have its objects registered with the ORB and exported through it. A second way is to use a special object adapter, uh, which would allow uh, any differences between the type system and the method of operation uh, of the uh, new object system to be able to be translated into uh, the orb. And then the third way is that I can think of the object system as an orb in itself and then simply build a gateway between that object system uh, and the orb. Whichever way uh, works best is going to depend upon uh, what the object system is, what its characteristics are, and how much freedom you have to go back and change it. Well, I see we have uh, an object system for system software. But where does the CORBA go from here? Well, uh, currently there is about a half a dozen, there may be more since they don't all have to register with me, uh, uh, implementations in progress in different companies. Some of them are from scratch. Some of them are adapting existing object systems. Um, there's currently widespread support for this because it does meet the needs uh, uh, of object systems. It allows object systems to work together. Uh, and it's the first object architecture that seriously addresses openness uh, and the evolution uh, of software in the presence of strong interfaces. Um, so the OMG is working to refine CORBA, to add some more language bindings and things like that. Um, and it's also using uh, CORBA and IDL as the basis for defining the further services that they're trying to standardize on. So uh, to try to summarize, we've sort of uh, talked about the challenges of uh, system software for uh, object technology uh, and uh, talked about how important interfaces are for this definitional property, uh, providing this taxonomy to the uh, services and, and, and components, uh, and uh, focusing on the issues of multiple, evolving, and, and, and open implementations. Um, We've, we've developed language bindings to try to make this stuff as convenient as possible for uh, uh, both the clients and the implementations. Uh, and the architecture supports a variety of different implementations in objects themselves, uh, in the orb itself, uh, and provides lots of opportunities for optimization and extension. And it does accomplish the, the, uh, one of the major goals of, of OMG in asking for the orb in the first place, which is it provides a variety of choices for how object systems connect together.